Are you gonna go down there? Oh my god! Oh my This Zoom meeting, 5.30 India time. Singapore is late, you know? It's 8 o'clock. I'm not sure if I'm not sure. Huh? Where does this light switch off from? I have to see. Hi, Sharanya. Hi, Namrata. Hi. Hope you're doing good. I am. How are you? I'm doing good, thanks. I'm sorry due to some technical issues, Chetan won't be able to join the session. So I'll be taking it over on his behalf. I hope that's okay. Absolutely, of course. It's, it's a real pleasure having you. Having it's attended good. a lot of your workshops and having noticed a lot of your work, it's, it's actually an absolute honor to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Navrata. That's very kind of you. And it's really my pleasure to be here as well. Yeah. I think we can start now. I can keep allowing guests as we go ahead. Sure. Oh, yeah. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday evening once again. So today we have Sharanya with us. Sharanya is the author of six books. She writes and illustrates fiction, poetry, children's literature, and nonfiction. Her work has won a South Asia Ladley Award and has been nominated for the Hindu Prize, the JCB Prize, the Neve Book Award, and other honors. She grew up in Sri Lanka and Malaysia and has lived in India since 2007. So let's begin with Sharanya. Uh, Sharanya, tell us about your writing journey and your choice of writing across genres. Thank you, Namrata. Um, like many people, well, I began to write when I was a child, uh, when mm -hmm. I was seven years old. That's not unusual at all. But what is um, a little more unusual is having continued to write. I think that sadly, many children and teenagers um, give it up at some point. Right. So I'm really glad to be speaking to a workshop of people who've also committed to their craft or return to it or discovered it later on. Um, it doesn't matter, it's a, it's a very precious thing. And, uh, you know, creativity is everybody's birthright. And I wish that it was inculcated more in schools and in families. So for me, like I said, I started when I was a child and I started to publish when I, you know, children's magazines, children's supplement of the newspaper and, and so on. And um, in my mid-teens, I became involved in the art scene in Kuala Lumpur, where I grew up. Um, and at the time, it was very vibrant. There were uh, any spoken word events, there were readings. I think was there at the time because since I left. Um, and, but I was very fortunate to, you know, to, to be able to connect with 
readers at uh, live events and so on. Um, and another really vital part of this journey for me was that it was a wonderful chain of secondhand bookstores called Payless Books, mm-hmm. where I could find uh, writing by women of color. And which I didn't access to otherwise um, because I, I didn't have uh, the privilege of uh, completing tertiary studies or, you know, books at bookstores are expensive if they are, um, you know, if you are yeah. a young person. Um, and libraries didn't necessarily have what I was looking for. But this secondhand bookstore chain brought in the most amazing books for very cheap. And I kind of um, taught myself, or I learned rather from these books. Um, and yeah, I, I had, I'd been publishing in journals anthologies from then. <laughs> When I was three, my first book of poetry came out, and I also became a newspaper columnist, and and, and things proceeded from from then on. Um, there was quite a lot between my first book and second, uh, which you know I think we talked about it before. So I, it would, um, yeah, uh, you know, things just sort of carried on. Yeah. And in the last six years, I've been really fortunate to have several books um, come out. And uh, the next one is due later this year. Sharanya, can I just ask you to be a little louder, I guess? The voice is not clear. There are a lot of people who are not able to hear you. Oh dear. Okay, let me let me try to be a little louder. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Sharanya, so uh, authors usually have long gaps in their writing and we have seen that you had one. So can you talk a bit about that? How did that come through and how has that changed you as a writer? You know, that long gap between my first book and the second and third was one of the best things that happened to me mm-hmm. as a writer. And um, we really need time, not just for our work, but for life. Right. Uh, and it's very important not to beat yourself up about targets you may set or um, you may see other writers who are producing a book every six months and so on. That's their pace and that's their journey. Um, so for me, it was it was not that I wasn't writing during that time. I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the most part, I think there was about a year and a half or two years in between when I wasn't writing. Uh, mm-hmm. But otherwise, I was slowly building um, a, a story collection as well as a poetry collection. And, you know, there, there was, I would not say that I was not a writer in that time. Of course I was. Mm. I was just not publishing books yet. Um, you know, uh, or rather there was, a, uh, there was a pause in my publishing career. And maybe at some point in this conversation, we can talk about the distinctions between a writing career and a publishing career because they're not necessarily the same thing, um, as I think some of your participants may already know. But um, yeah, I want to say that it's a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing to honor your pace, to honor your journey, to honor um, the pace of the work itself because every project is different. One of the projects that I've been working on, I've been uh, writing it on and off for about 15 years. And I've published almost seven books in the interim time. And there's a right time for every project in the same way that as readers, there's a right time 
for us to experience each book, something that shakes us at 14 years old may seem lackluster when we read it um, 15 years old. Something that we find completely boring um, at 20 may be the most illuminating thing uh, that we needed at 35. So honor the pace of things. Um, even if you are goal-oriented and you set um, a disciplined schedule by which you write, um, don't attach publishing goalposts because those goalposts will change for various reasons, um, some of which include just, just life. This is a question I've always wanted to ask you. So a lot of the people in this group are also poets. And as we know, the, the saying in the market is that poetry does not sell. It's very difficult to get published, but you have traditionally published poetry collections. So is there any guidance, any tips or any suggestion that you can give to poets who want to you know, make it big, be traditionally published? So let me reiterate, poetry does not sell. <laughs> uh, but neither does literary fiction, neither, neither do most um, genres other than commercial and, you know, commercial nonfiction as well. So, yeah, um, in terms of, you know, making it big, what does making it big mean if it's about money? Uh, that's definitely a topic we should talk about. Um, in terms of publishing a poetry collection or a short story collection for that matter, it's very, very important to build up a portfolio of publishing credentials. So send your work to magazines, send your work to journals. It's absolutely vital. You cannot bypass this because when your manuscript lands up at an editor's desk or in the slush pile, if they don't, if they haven't heard of your name, it's not likely that they continue to read because you may have noticed that the big publishers in India maybe publish a couple of poetry collections a year. So it's very competitive at that level and they do reject beautiful manuscripts. It's not because of the manuscript and neither is it because of the editor. It's because that's their business model. So one way to, um, to kind of ensure that you have a better chance is to publish as much as you can in magazines and journals. Um, there are several awards in India as well for emerging writers, especially for poets. And these are things which you can apply for just so that there's a little bit of, um, you know, to use a highly, highly commercial term, brand recognition so that people know your name when your manuscript lands up on someone's desk. They've heard of your work and they may therefore be interested um, in reading it in their busy schedule. Um, aside from that, I would also say that niche publishers and self-publishing are very viable options for poets. This has always been the case and it continues to be the case. So if you're putting together a manuscript of poems, again, try and publish individual works. Um, it's okay to have published up to half the collection, I think, because people do want new and unpublished work in a book as well. Um, and try and check out some workshops or even some websites which have this kind of information about how to order a manuscript. Because there is a certain internal logic to a poetry collection which um, a novel does not necessarily have and sometimes not even a short story collection because it has a fewer number of pieces. Um, but if you have 50 to 60 poems, which is the average number in the book, you have to figure out some thread which will create a flow 
um, and begin to see them not just as individual pieces, but as part of a whole. And the sum has to add up to something more. Um, so that you know, that's a particular that's a particular rhythm that you need to that you need to find and trust in your own work. Thank you. I'm sure that has been very helpful to all the poets. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about your experience with the publishing industry? Any advice or wisdom for our community here? Um, don't, uh, don't leave your day job. That would be my <laughs> number one piece of advice for any writer in this country you cannot make a living from your books. It's just not possible if you write in English, unless you write um, very yeah. But I think even the time for that has passed. Um, so this is a reality which most aspiring writers don't know about, readers are completely unaware of, and authors don't talk about, which I think is really doing a disservice uh, to, to everyone concerned. So it's something that I talk about frequently. Um, don't leave your day job. You can't unless you're independently wealthy or something. Um, what you need to find, and it can be a challenge to keep this alive, um, you need to find a reason why you keep putting your work out there when it doesn't bring you wealth. <laughs> um, it doesn't even bring you enough so that you can uh, leave a yeah. form of work. Um, and it actually won't actually change your life. <laughs> Publishing a book does not change your life. Your life is still the same. Uh, the problems you have in your personal life are the same. The things that um, are important to you uh, remain the same. Um, and these are, you know, these are elements of the journey which I really don't see a lot of authors discussing. Um, so knowing all this, at least in theory, um, why do you write and why do you publish? These are questions to ask yourself not just once or twice, but to ask them again and again and again. Um, I've had different points in my career at different stages where I wanted to pull back, I didn't want to write, um, or I didn't want to publish, or I didn't think I could write anymore. Um, there have been natural ebbs. Uh, there have also been sort of circumstance-related or trauma-related ebbs as well. And these are, all, these are all a part of the journey. But just to come back to the publishing industry, that is definitely the, the one thing that I want all of you to know, that uh, you will need a different source of income. Um, yeah. I think that has been a very helpful advice there and a very honest one at that, because that's exactly how uncertain this career path is, if you look at it at the moment. So when we spoke, you talked about the importance of reading. So can you share a little more about it? Because writing and reading are two habits which go hand in hand for every writer to inculcate in their schedule. Um, I agree with you, but it's not true that all writers read. Uh, yes, I agree. Yeah, a surprising number of writers and aspiring writers don't read, which is baffling and a little bit infuriating even, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm glad that, that at least everyone present here already understands the importance. So, I mean, it's hardly a subject that I need to, that I need to touch on. But one thing I would like to add is about um, reading more diversely and broadly. Um, there's a lot that's published which we don't hear about because um, there is such a thing as a marketing department at every publishing house and they have a budget, they have targets, they have books that, they're, that are their focus. So we hear about the hyped ones. We 
don't hear about everything out there. And it's not necessary that we need to. Um, but just maintaining that sense of inquisitiveness that I think we all would have had, especially when we were uh, readers as children, where, you know, especially in pre-social media, yeah. uh, it was just exciting to go into a bookstore or into a library and just discover things. I think maintaining that curiosity is really quite important. Um, uh, VK Kartika, who is one of the yeah. publishing, she's one of the top people in publishing in, in India, put up a tweet, I think a week or two ago, about how she talks to aspiring authors in India, who when asked uh, who was the last Indian author, author they read, yeah. then, <laughs> all the answers, they don't read. Um, yeah. They don't read locally based authors. And that's very telling of many, many different things that I, I think, you know, um, we'll have different theories for it. Um, my theories are, um, one is there is definitely a, a kind of impurity complex still, uh, the presumption that locally produced work is of a lower quality but who do these authors expect will read their books? Yeah. You know, uh, if they're not reading what's out there, if they're not supporting um, literature being produced locally, um, you know, it, it certainly it certainly creates some interesting conversations and discussions, uh, which you know maybe we can we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think we already know the importance of reading; otherwise, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. Yeah, actually, coming to Twitter, I think you have a book release happening recently, as you just mentioned, and then you've quoted an author who said that every book carves its own fortune and I would just want this book to go out in the world and you know carve a path of its own I actually loved it is that how you deal with this uh, pressure of having to market the books after the pressure of writing them I would love to know your yeah. thoughts on that so this is highly subjective I know authors who really enjoy mm -hmm. the lit festivals who really enjoy um, you know the promotions right and and uh, all of that I am not somebody who enjoys it it's something that I do because mm -hmm. it's part of what I have to do mm -hmm. um, because otherwise I'm not being fair to my work um, so again like I said it is very subjective but I think uh, you know coming from that place of doing it quite reluctantly, I found that it's very important to sort of demarcate in my own head, um, you know, the, the amount of time that I spend on it. Um, and also uh, a, a kind of emotional detachment in a way, uh, which, is, which is a little bit difficult to explain because when I'm talking about my books, I am passionate. Uh, that's is real, but a, a kind of detachment from one's um, um, public image, maybe like it, it, it's very. I, I don't really know how to how to uh, describe the way I feel about it, except that I have quite complicated feelings about it. Um, and one thing that I've been doing more recently is that some of my social media accounts are private, um, and you know. Uh, some of that is because of uh, circumstances in my personal life. I just, you know, I just want to be a little bit nice. more um, And in, in fact, Navrita, when we were, uh, when you approached me, yeah. and I, you know, oh, I, I love that this is a close space because I, I don't want to have to put up yeah, the poster. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. These are also, these can also be faces. Um, yeah. But one thing I can tell you for sure, is that with or without that push, um, books have their own journeys. They just do. And it's not something which 
a marketing department can control. It's not something that a social media presence can control. It's not something that anything can control. It's, it has its own journey. And sometimes the journey is, um, um, it's unexpected. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if I can give a few examples from my own books, I, um, having a book published in February uh, during the pandemic, the absence of live events, and then shortly after experiencing a bereavement myself, it's really not been the uh, easiest of, of times. And yet the book is finding readers. Um, and, you, you know, similarly with, with the, I, and I'm talking about a, a children's picture book called Mermaids in the Moonlight yeah. that came out in February. Um, my first picture book, The Amuchi Puchi, when it first came out in 2016, it was only okay. It was kind of expensive here in India. It didn't sell very well in the UK, mm -hmm. but it got good. To a whole second life, which I wasn't even prepared for, um, you know, uh, because I I had been working on another book and I was waiting for that book to come out. And in between, this book comes out, and suddenly I was doing events, I was in schools, I was um, swept up in um, in the flow of this book, uh, which was ages after, not just it, when it was first published, but that book took five years to find a publisher. Five years. Yeah. So, you know, it's, um, you, you just, you cannot anticipate uh, these things at all. Um, yeah. So my next question is, uh, what about awards? That is something we don't understand much. And you seem to have won quite a lot of awards. So any wisdom that you would like to share with us? I've actually only won a couple of awards, but my books have been nominated for several of them. Uh, again, I think this is another thing that people don't uh, realize about the publishing industry. Um, awards don't consider every book that's published. Mm -hmm. There have to be submissions and there are restrictions on them. <clears throat> so I, you know, for many of the very <clears throat> the publisher can only send two books from their catalog in a certain category. So it's very, very competitive um, and should not feel that, you know, oh, I had a book out and it didn't get any nominations at all. Um, you, that, that, that does not at all speak about the quality of the book. It just means that um, perhaps the book was not submitted um, or else it was submitted, but you know, uh, the, the, the judges had their own preferences and um, tastes and sometimes even biases. Um, I think, yeah, the, these are important things to know. And also things like, you know, people very freely say, oh, you know, this book should get the booker. This book should get the Pulitzer. But they don't understand that the Pulitzer Prize is only for American citizens. The Booker Prize, you need to have a novel published in the UK that the publisher has submitted. And um, the publisher has to pay like thousands of pounds toward the marketing of, of uh, that book. And, you know, like that, there are all these intricacies which have to do is ultimately a capitalist system, which we as readers, as well as, as writers, are, are unaware of. Um, yeah. Oh, and there's one more thing I wanted to say. I'm very lucrative prices now. Um, but, you know, a, a super lucrative prize will change the life of one author a year. There is no trickle down. Companies don't really have um, any 
tangible benefit from it, you know. So I think having awards out there is always lovely. It's great to be recognized. It's great to have buzz around, um, you know, around new books and have lots of people talking about the same books and uh, book clubs and all of that. All of that is a lot of fun. Um, but we need to reorient our focus so that it, it isn't about the most visible success, but it is about sustainability for the culture at large so that more people are able to write more often, publish more often, and gain more satisfaction uh, from their own career. Thanks. I think still quite a lot of people are not able to hear you clearly. Oh, I, I, I don't know what else to do other than to like get a microphone or something. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Let's move on to our next question. So how important is a degree in writing according to you or literature in general? Do you think that impacts the way a writer is able to write or a poet is able to create their poetry. Um, having an MFA is still a, a, a sign of huge privilege. And um, it is not necessary. I don't have any degree at You know, and that wasn't out of choice. I have degrees in um, in writing, you know, maybe in literature, maybe in English, but not creative writing, which has only recently become available, um, you know, at, at the tertiary level in India, anyway. So until until now, um, you would. Have abroad so you know you, you're already privileged you're already connected and privilege begets pri privilege so I I wouldn't say that that's that is the trajectory to set your eyes on um, and I also feel that you know for instance if you look at American writing some sometimes there's a sterility to it not yeah. always but sometimes and there are certain MFA programs which are known for uh, churning out writers who create this kind of work. Um, it would not be a good thing if an MFA became a prerequisite to publication. And um, there's, there's certainly a danger of, of that happening, not immediately, but you know, sometime in uh, sometime in the not too distant future when you've had enough cohorts graduating with this degree. Um, so, it, you know, it's not an impediment to not have an MFA, not at all. Thank you. Thank you for this. With this, I would like to open the floor to questions. Would any of you like to ask anything to Sharanya? You can either send it to the chat box or you can maybe raise your hands and unmute yourself and ask them. Sharna, while we gather the other set of questions, there's one more thing I wanted to ask. So as you said that you've taken breaks and uh, <clears throat> there is a lot of risk in taking breaks because you know, a writer tends to get disillusioned and you also have the fear where maybe you lose your readers because of the saying out of sight, out of mind. So what do you think about that? Any words to stay focused at that time and not worry about the other things? So um, this actually reminds me of a part of your first question that I had forgotten to address about working in multiple genres. Mm -hmm. I write poetry, fiction, nonfiction, children's yeah. books. I'm an illustrator as well. Um, so every book has its own readership. And you know you're not going to lose readers uh, just you know just because you've not published for some time. In fact, there's a danger of possibly even being too saturated. Um, you know, uh, if you're a very very great writer. 
Um, but the audiences for different genres are different. The audiences for different books are different as well. But um, in terms of feeling disillusioned and so on, there are many writers who you publishing, um, not just industry-wise, but just, you know, like I said earlier, it doesn't change your life. It doesn't make you rich. It doesn't, um, you know, that certainly disillusions people. Is that a bad thing? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think it still comes down to what you want. If you want to stop writing, that's fine. Um, or, you know, if you want to take a break for some time and then maybe come back to it later, that's also fine. Uh, it's much more dangerous to force a piece of writing out than it is to just let it have the journey that it wants to have, uh, take the time that it wants to have. So we have some questions for you. Sonia wants to know, how do you think a poet must approach their work in progress? Should they experiment a lot with form? What, according to you, are the requisites for a decent set of poems that someone may want to put together? Experimenting with form is a really good way to not just uh, hone your skills, but also to break through writer's block. Um, because something about the confinement actually makes you think creatively um, and just do what you can within that limitation. So working with form is a, is a really interesting um, practice um, and something that I definitely encourage. It doesn't need to limit you, however. You can continue to write free words as well and you mix it up. My collection, The Altar of the Only World, is a mix of formal yeah. free words. Um, so uh, that, that's with regards to form. In terms of, you said prerequisites for a decent collection, right? Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You need to have enough poems, uh, not too few, not too many. 50 to 60 is the sweet spot. Um, you know, I think it's good to have people whom you share your work with, other writers who can give you feedback. And it doesn't need to be like a workshop or critiquing uh, level. It can also just be people you trust. Um, and you should trust yourself. I think that's something which, really? which, which is an ongoing struggle. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. Um, but yeah, trusting yourself is important because given that um, opportunities to publish full and poetry collections are very few, most people we'll actually find ourselves in situations where we are uh, publishing with very small presses or self-publishing or doing um, uh, KDP publishing online. Uh, so if that is actually in your hands, uh, it's all the more important to get feedback. Uh, you know, if you don't have an editor, if you don't have uh, a traditional publishing system that's already decided, okay, your book is, is good enough. But, but like I said earlier, uh, they have to reject most poetry manuscripts. So we need a different internal um, measurement for what is good. So Nivedita has asked, when do you revise your piece after writing a poem? How much time do you leave it alone before revisiting it? You know, I haven't actually written poetry in a while, so I have to think back. Um, I honestly, I, 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 I don't revise that much. Mm -hmm. I follow my intuition. I am called to write. And then I usually know, I just know 
if something needs a second look or if it's done. And, um, you know, it, it varies from piece to piece. Um, and, uh, you know, th then I'll also know set this aside for a while. Like, there have been some poems which I've, you know, for example, if it's like a sestina, which is a, which is a very demanding uh, form, I've started it and done three verses and then just left it for like three years, forgotten about it, found it in my computer, completed it uh, much later. Like, it, it's a very subjective process. So you will also have your own very subjective process. And the key is to, you know, the key is really finding out what works for you. Um, as I said earlier, it is about trusting yourself. Um, and when you have a finely honed um, instinct for your own rhythms and the rhythm of your work, then you'll know, you'll know when mm. to take that back and for how long, um, yeah. Subi wants to know your writing process from the first draft till the publishing journey. Depends on the depends on the book again. Um, yeah, every book has its own journey. Every project has its own journey. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've I've already talked about this. So if there's something specific that you want to know that that could be useful for you, uh, let me know. Yeah. Manish wants to know which journals do you recommend for poetry submissions. Um, right now, you know, I would say just go online and just look up lists. There are so many lists out there. It's better if you try to publish internationally for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One is your audience is broader. Second is you're more likely to find a paying market. Um, and, you know, it's uh, sadly, especially as poets, we wind up having to short sell ourselves uh, because nobody wants to buy the work. Um, <laughs> and I don't mean just the book. I mean, literally nobody wants to, uh, you know, pay for the book itself. Mm. Like, like, you know, for example, The Altar of the Only World, I, I never received an advance for it. There was no advance, even at uh, a major traditional publisher um, because, the idea is the prestige of publishing with them and the infrastructure they provide should be enough. But on the other hand, I've also had experiences where I've been commissioned to write and perform one poem and been paid $3,000. So it's extremely arbitrary. Um, so that being the case, keep an eye on the paying markets, especially international journals. Um, and just send your work out. Like you're, you're going to get tons of objections, tons of rejections. It's just it's part of it, it's just a part of the journey. Don't worry about it. Don't don't you know? Don't feel like you need to stop sending your work out. Don't stop until you hit. You know, pick pick a ridiculous number. Pick sixty journals. Send it to sixty journals. Even if the first. 40 reject you and you feel like you're not going to place the work, send it to the remaining 20 because that's a commitment to yourself. Eventually, you will hit bullseye with some piece of weapon. And, you know, it, it, it's good to go into it knowing this, but part of trusting yourself is having self-compassion, which means, you know, do do the things which make you um which remind you of why you write and treat yourself well every time you have a rejection have an ice cream really really you know <laughs> um because it's important if you if you don't look after yourself and your well-being the disillusionment that we talked about earlier may set in way way before your book start coming out. True. Nivedita Ramesh, uh, I think you have your hand raised. Did you want to ask something? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, it was a little long, the question, so I thought I'll just speak it. Yeah, hi, sure. hi, Sharanya. It's, uh, it's fantastic to meet you. I'm a big admirer of your work, and I'm so excited. I've been excited all week. 
<laughs> so the, uh, yeah <laughs> i told everyone anyway so my first question is specifically um, actually both my questions are relating to the queen of jasmine country uh, which is a book i started uh, reading and then i stopped and then i started again but this time i can't put it down a uh, question specifically because it is set in a historical context right so uh, you have referenced um, you know uh, real events real people um, as well and it's very fictionalized or you know your take on it so um, i just want to talk about the sensitivity of these things and right? when you put it out there and generally when you write anything historical uh, you know what is the things that you keep in mind or you know um what what would you have any apprehensions and you know how do you do thank you, you so it? much um uh, for your kind words uh, about my work i'm really glad that you are enjoying my book um yeah the, i there it, it's very scary to publish at this time uh in this country because there's been such a a, a clamp down on any kind of dissent any kind not even dissent just diversity of thought diversity of expression it is very very frightening um and i was very frightened when i was publishing that book i remained frightened for a long time now and then i still get frightened again you know when i hear about something happening to some writer or um i i wish i could just be courageous and tell you you know some very kind of um, inspiring thing but um i can't because that's not how i feel it is a scary time to write and to publish um sensitivities which didn't necessarily exist a decade ago are now landmines um and i Hmm. I'm. I'm really trying so hard to, 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 you know, like, like, give you something useful. <laughs> I'm. But yeah. Do you? Yeah. So I was also. What about the general historical context? Like, um, you know, India's history. So there are certain, uh, you know, important men and women, um, whom you want to, who who you want to include in your story. Um, is one. Why one question is is that okay? And the second question is, um, is it. you know i mean yeah i mean is it okay and how would you do it i mean what if i want to just portray that person is differently from what they are generally understood to be okay so um basically if i'm hearing you correctly if you're asking for permission to do this you have to give yourself that permission because it is yeah. this is as scary as it is and as somebody who gave myself that permission i'm still telling you that mm-hmm. it is scary and that fear mm-hmm. doesn't go even after publication even mm-hmm. you know even though uh, you know there's so many readers and there's a, a lot of love and so on um the fear doesn't go away so can you um live with that fear mm-hmm. if if it's a choice you can make fantastic sometimes it may not be a choice because that book oh my god it was like being hit by a hurricane i wrote the whole novel in 6 weeks um i just it took me over like there was no question of me saying no you know like i'm a little worried about this um you know that there, there, there's something happening around this specific historical figure right now as i'm writing i just i i couldn't um i just had to honor and this i think has been really the theme of our conversation i had to honor um the work that was coming through me and somewhere if you do that i cannot promise that you'll feel okay i cannot promise that you'll be safe i cannot even promise myself that um but you will have a sense of having done right by your work because what tony morrison said about the the pain of an untold story is real and i think most of us here would have experienced it if there is if there is a story that is just com- telling you write it write it okay great i have one more question i hope that's okay okay that's again relating to queen of jasmine country and specifically about the tamil sangam poetry um and you mentioned the sources of your inspiration you have mentioned a couple of translations in the book uh, but i wanted to just um understand a little more about how you discovered it and explored it 
Um, and I'll tell you why, because I myself recently, I just stumbled upon it three days back. Um, and the thing is, I can read Tamil, but I'm not uh, proficient enough to understand poetry. And somewhere I have this guilt that, oh, you know, I don't know enough of my own mother tongue to read it in its originality, reading it in translation, you, know, you sort of miss something in between. And uh, so should I now learn enough to read it? You know, these are all my thoughts. So I just wanted to understand your journey of, uh, you know, about Tamil Sangam poetry in specific. You know, I'm glad you asked because I'm not a very proficient Tamil reader either. Um, and specifically with Queen, what helped was I read the originals. I read Archana Venkatesan's translations. Mm. Um, and I also listened to the recitations over and over. So, you know, if you have mm. uh, that access, if you're working with uh, text that has um, also been recorded in audio format, that will really help because if you're a slightly slow reader like I am, uh, reading it on the page, you may be able to read it, but you know the comprehension the comprehension doesn't sink in. When I heard it, I could understand. Uh, you know, because of specifically of, uh, when it, when it comes to Tamil, that that's something um, special about this language where you can understand ancient Tamil, and um, you know, like the the Sangam age poems and so on spoke of such universal um, and highly identifiable um, feelings, right? Um, yeah, and again, it's about giving yourself permission. Uh, for instance, Ravi Shankar and Priya Sarkai Chapriya, who are also Andal translators, they don't read Tamil. Um, oh, okay. Uh, they, I didn't know that. They worked with, they worked with a pundit who was reciting to them. And um, I, I'm not sure if, you know, I think Ravi Shankar doesn't even speak Tamil, um, mm. you know, and a, another famous example would be Coleman Barks, the most famous Rumi translator who doesn't know Persian um, and would, you know, work with other translations. So, uh, you know, there are interesting questions about what this means, the legitimacy of this, the authenticity, all of that, like I think like great conversations. But the fact is that many people have been giving themselves permission. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it comes back to, you know, what you said earlier as well, that you just, you have to give yourself permission. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> great, thank you so much. Pleasure. Sharanya, we have one more question. With regards to income from writing, hasn't the growth of OTT and other video formats increased the demand for quality content and originally story, original story writing? This is from Richard. Um, Richard, can you give me a little bit more information? I'm not sure what the connect between book publishing and OTT is. Okay, so I am referring to basically just the writing part as a writer. There may be, you may be looking at publishing as one stream of income, but that, that uh, the same story could also be given for film rights or OTT rights or uh, if you can bring additional stream of revenue. So when they're saying that, you know, writing may not be something that can, you know, lights on at home, uh, maybe uh, with OTT and things coming up and more original writing coming into demand, this may be something that's changing. That's what in your opinion as you're somebody out there seeing it happen. Um, I don't know if it's changed, to be honest, uh, because we're talking about a, a different industry and also capitalist industry, but with a lot more money in it. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not sure I've seen the effect, um, in terms of writers making a living because have you, have you come across many writers who've made the jump into screenwriting? or been able to sell rights and so on? A few, but I've not been so close to ask them about the revenue stream, how it's really changed. But I see that uh, that's become more of a focus of people who are in the industry, who are writing today, who are looking at trying to put it out in a way that when they brought their books, they also want to try and adapt it into a way that becomes, if, uh, to pitch it to people mm -hmm. for uh, building a web series or building a movie. It's more on the web series side, actually. I am not seeing so much of it going into the movies, but I'm seeing a lot of these guys trying to focus on creating and getting it into a web series. Uh, 
but yeah, I was wondering if it actually has uh, there's a ripple down effect. But as you're saying, you haven't seen it yourself, I guess, right yeah, now. Just, you know, my my experience or knowledge is also limited to you know to what I've encountered. But perhaps this is an interesting development. What you're saying, uh, if you know of people who are actually writing with a, a different target in mind, uh, the adaptability of their work. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Interesting to know this. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you. Richard, just to add to your question, I say this as an insider who's working on scripts and publishing with authors. The flow of income hasn't exactly changed for the authors. It has for the publishing houses. The authors still get a flat fee on their books. So unfortunately, the income still remains the same technically for any writer if the book is picked up they are not paid they are not paid on a recurring basis like if their movies telecast every sunday like surya vansham is they are not paid every sunday for it it's just a one time buy there that's that's all that happens so even jerry pinto who does a lot of translation says that he gets paid 25000 for one book for translation that's it that's it then there's no recurring charges payment that come through but he does it because he enjoys doing translation he enjoys bringing that story to mainstream so sometimes it's also for the love of story as sharanya rightly says you know every book has its own journey you want the story to go forward that's it okay Thank you, thank you so much, Sharanya, for sharing your journey with us. Um, does anybody else want to share anything else about the week, about writing, about FDC, or about anything else? I'm happy to answer any more questions you may have as well. Sure. <clears throat> no, I think they all are reeling under the hard facts of <laughs> publishing. <laughs> which have been endorsed today i guess yeah thank you thank you so much manish thank you so i think we should end this session here thank you so much sharanya for your time it was great interacting with you was and look forward to having you again yeah thank you thank you all of you take care well thanks for spending sunday evening and i you know i really hope that i've uh, not <laughs> disillusioned you it's just things that we all need to know because this is what publishing reality is yeah um, you know what i what i said to nivedita um, is true for all of us give yourself that permission give yourself the permission to write what you really want to write that's very important yes thank you thank you so much you. bye bye everyone thank, thank you. you thank you bye thank you bye, bye everyone thank you